Hi everyone, my name is Angie Vishianen and I am the founder of Leg Up Legal. We provide a mentoring program that connects pre-law students to lawyers for mentoring so they can learn more about the legal profession before they decide if they want to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into law school <laughs> and three more years of their life. And so uh, we've been bringing in lawyers and law school admissions consultants and all sorts of people to talk to you every single week about things that will help you in your legal career journey. And I'm excited to introduce today um, Sherilyn Stevenson and Stephanie Trujillo, and they're going to talk to you about um, being the changing lawyer. So, you know, especially in these times, lawyers need to adapt to um, all the changes that are happening. You know, we need to be able to adapt to new technology. We need to be able to adapt um, to new changes in our practice. And it's important that you continue up changing your skills. And so that's what Sherilyn and Stephanie are going to share with you today. So Stephanie and Sherilyn, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Angie. Hi, I'm Sherilyn. I'm one of the founding um, partners of The Changes. And The Changes is really um, a legal consulting firm. We go around and we help other law firms and law departments really become more efficient and put the business back into legal. That's not something that is necessarily taught. Um, in law school. And so we are excited to bring a lot of those best practices to you. We're excited to talk to you today. And Stephanie is one of the, um, one of our, you know, very excited um, employees that we have here at The Changes. And with her position, she takes on some staff augmentation of some law firms and she brings business processes into them. So I'll let Stephanie give a quick introduction of herself. Hi everybody, I'm Stephanie Trujillo. Um, I am in Denver, Colorado. I am a virtual chief operations officer for The Changes. Um, and as Sherilyn said, you know, I focus a lot more on the business operational side of a law firm. Um, you know, it's really important that you have somebody at the firm who understands these things, um, especially when, you know, you're a small to mid-sized firm and you may not, you know, um, as an attorney, you may not understand, you know, how to um, run a law office. So what we do is we go in and we kind of take a scan um, of, you know, how you guys are operating um, or how the firm is operating. And we make recommendations on how to um, work more efficiently and bring more revenue into the office. So, yeah. No, thanks, Stephanie. So I want to start off by first, let me share my screen and I can share with you uh, screen and share. Getting these tools down during this pandemic has been very necessary. Um, so as Stephanie was um, just saying, and I was, we are the changes. And just a quick overview of who we are. Um, this is really our manifesto. We are aiming to disrupt an industry that has historically been resistant to disruption. Law firms have been operating the same way since the beginning of time. And so we're really here to put those business principles back in place. And we're going to share with you a lot of the best practices we've learned from the other side. So you may be used to hearing and learning from attorneys. And we're here to talk to you more from a business, business perspective perspective, as well as from a support team perspective. Um, both Stephanie and I have decades of paralegal and management experience within law firms. So we'll be able to talk to you as ones who have been responsible and cultured um, a lot of incoming attorneys who were new from summer internships all the way up to partner and been side by side with them. We'll be able to help you with that. One of the things we're very proud of here at The Changes that's very important to us is that we um, focus on mental health. We realize the importance of it, and we certainly realize the importance of it within this legal industry. And so we will also dig a little bit more into that. Now, the first thing, though, is I like to start off by learning a little bit more about you. And I'm assuming all of you are like me and you have your phone within a you know, 12 inches of reach. And so pull those out because we're going to do a quick poll based off of just a couple of questions we have that'll get, 
let us know who you are. And here's an opportunity for once you text your answer to this question, it is going to allow us to just learn a little bit more. Um, so as you can see on the screen, you can text to this number. And I'd like to just hear why you chose this career path. All right. Yeah, I hear that a lot about people wanting the financial security of being an attorney. Um, okay, great. So thank you guys for that input. And then I have one more question. And that question is, so what do you want to do with your law degree? All right, and we'll give just about 10 more seconds on this before we move forward. Okay. Okay, and helping my family, great. Okay, well, thank you all so much for those answers. That's really helpful for us to um, see and so let's just move right into the nitty gritty of this presentation, which is these are the things that are not taught in law school, but we really think that it's important that you know these things. And um, I'll start off and of course, Stephanie, feel free to chime in. Like I said, we've been in this industry in every kind of role possible you can imagine. So we've seen a little bit of a lot and um, we'd love to share some of these best practices as well as things we have learned along the way um, based off of all of these years of experience. So right off the bat, I would say the most important thing that is not taught in law school but is very necessary to know is relating to people and clients. So we want, it is so important that you're showing interest in your clients and also that you come off in a non-judgmental way. Um, attorneys already have more of a reputation and, uh, and one that is earned that they are typically argumentative or that they are the smartest ones. They're just going to argue their point until they're right. So you're kind of fighting an uphill battle that even though people are hiring you for your expertise, it's still important that you can relate with them. It's still important that they don't fear you as the smartest person in the room, but that they really see you as partners. And so that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting balance that you really have to come up with is we're hiring you because of your expertise, but we don't want to feel that you think we're dumb at the same time. So it's very important that you're listening, that you are relating to them, that you are also um, talking to them in a way that is compassionate. And so Stephanie, I know you've probably been in a lot of um, intake sessions and have listened to clients along the way. And so, and especially when we're talking about discovery. And for those of you who are not very familiar with what discovery is, discovery is a very important part of a case where the way that you answer questions under oath in a, in a, you know, courtroom, it's the same thing, except for these are written. And so these are questions that are asked of you under oath, and you're having to answer to them. And as a paralegal and an attorney in a law firm, you spend a lot of time with the client making sure that these um, questions are answered correctly and you really partner with each other. So Stephanie can chime in a little bit more about how important listening effectively is and the necessity of providing feedback and how that whole process works. Right, exactly. I mean, think about it from this perspective. You're going to be spending time with this with this person or these people over, you know, the life cycle of your case. So that can go, 
you know, anywhere from a year to two, three, four, five years potentially, right? So making that connection with them is really important because they, you know, there are going to be so many ups and downs throughout, especially if you're in litigation. Um, there are going to be so many ups and downs throughout that process. And really, if you have a genuine, authentic connection with them, then it makes those, you know, really hard times a lot easier, um, you know. Um, and so, again, Sherilyn mentioned, you know, how important it is, um, you know, to um, relate. And um, you do that by, you know, just making sure that you're keeping your client updated, you know, giving them the hard truths, right? I mean, sometimes, you know, you want to come off as empathetic, um, especially like, for example, in a personal injury case where they sustained, you know, um, injuries that could be, you know, lifelong injuries, um, you want to come off as, you know, empathetic and well, not come off, but you want to be empathetic and um, you want them to be able to trust you. Um, so it's really important just to yeah, maintain um, a great relationship with your client. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, earlier in my career, one of my, um, the job that I probably had the most amount of compassion and things that I love doing is I worked for a medical malpractice law firm. And I specifically dealt only with injuries that resulted in death from, um, you know, from baby deaths at that. So the, that's when my listening skills and my empathetic skills um, had to really increase in a whole different way because now you're dealing with clients who just lost a baby and that really forced me to have to change in how I relate to them because of, again, that fine art of there's a job to get done and we are here to provide a service but we also are here to listen to you and to you there's there that's why it's called counselors of law as well because if you do advise and you do counsel as well with your clients Denise brought up a really good point in the chat. You know, she said one of the many reasons why per this profession needs more diverse lawyers. You're absolutely right. I mean, just like with teachers too, right? I mean, students need to feel connected. Um, they need to feel like they can, um, that there is a mutual understanding, you know, whether it's background, culture, you know. Um, so very good point, Denise. Thank you. Um, and then mental health. I talked about how we focus on mental health and donating to mental health as a company. And that is by no mistake. This is very important. You heard it here first, if you haven't heard it anywhere else. Being an attorney, it is at the, is in the top five of careers and professions that struggle with mental health, with addictions, with um, anxiety, that it is a very stressful position and it's stressful because it's supposed to be stressful because if you have a lot of people relying on you it's you know kind of what my dad told me whenever I was interested in starting this company up and when he was asking me my why and I was explaining to him about my want to help others and his exact phrase to me was, well, when you work for a corporation, you have one boss, but when you are an entrepreneur and you work for yourself, you have a lot of bosses because now you have a lot of clients. So of course you have mental health that is very important to keep strong and to stay on top of and to not put so much on yourself and to give yourself grace. So that is why we are very focused on donating and highlighting and providing tips on keeping your mental health intact here. Here's the next thing on number four, conflict management. It's not if you're gonna have conflict management, if you're going to have conflict, you are definitely going to have conflict. As an attorney, as an advisor, as an employer, as all of those things, you will definitely have conflict. 
um, being an attorney, uh, most of them have a certain personality type. It's kind of necessary to be in that job. And being an advisor and not, there's going to be times you rub people the wrong way. You're going to come off in the wrong way. And you're going to have stressful times, especially if you're a litigator or a trial attorney. Those are going to be a little bit more stressful. You're dealing with deadlines. You're dealing with, um, you know, what could be perceived as a bogus motion from opposing counsel that you're having to answer to and um, allegations that don't make sense. And so it gets frustrating. And that you're still human. So when you're frustrated, then the people around you get hit the worst, your family, your colleagues, and you're going to have to really learn the art of conflict management. There is not a conflict management class in law school, unfortunately, although there should be, because this is honestly something you're going to deal with. You're going to have conflict with your paralegal. You're going to have conflict with your secretary. You may have conflict with your receptionist. You'll have conflict at home. And so the sooner that we can um, address those ways of respectfully handling and dealing with that conflict management, which still plays right into mental health and taking care of yourself, then that's going to make this profession a lot more um, attainable for you. And I really, you know, want to stress how important that is to get that under control because you don't want to be in front of a judge and dealing with, you know, an issue that you could have resolved with opposing counsel without the judge, you know, having to intervene. Um, it's pretty much an expectation that you don't come to the court with nonsense. So it's very important that you can, you know, um, get things resolved um, with opposing counsel or, you know, whatever beforehand. Yeah, and that is just a great point too, Stephanie, because a lot of people think that just because there's an adverse party or an adverse counsel, so with opposing counsel, that it has to be adversary. The surprising thing for me was seeing how the best attorneys really partner and collaborate with opposing counsel. And especially when it comes to trials, yes, we have different opposing sides, but that doesn't mean we have to hate each other. That doesn't mean that we don't give each other grace. There's times that I've seen where, sure, opposing counsel could you know, hold us to the fire and say, no, you served this discovery three days late. But sometimes there's just grace to be given within the profession and you don't have to make everyone your enemy. Um, and you can still have opposing counsel be advocates of yourself. And that's also just such an important skill to know that you are, you're not trying to make enemies of anyone. Right. Right. It's so important to collaborate if you can, you know, with opposing counsel, as long as you guys are both reasonable, I mean, there should be no reason why you can't do it. Um, it's so great going into a trial where, you know, you have a set of stipulated facts. All, all of your exhibits might be stipulated too. I mean, you save so much time collaborating up front with the other side um, in a trial and it eventually, you know, it obviously saves your clients money too. Yeah. And think of it this way. It's the same concept. And I know some of you may be a little um, young for, to understand what it's like if you go through a divorce and have kids. And it's the same concept of why people say it's better to have a great co-parenting relationship. You could have come from a broken home, for example. And I think you would understand it's, just way better to have an open co-parenting relationship. Obviously, you know, the two parents were not a good match for each other, but that doesn't mean that you're not just a good type of, um, that having that co-parenting relationship benefits the kids. It benefits the family and it's just less stress. So it's the same concept and really being an attorney and being, um, you know, being a professional, it's not very different expected in your life. And so um, 
thing that we want to do you is about business skills. So this is where math does matter, y'all. If you can't believe it, we um, went through school all these years and thought, I'm never going to need the quadratic equation, even though I still remember it's the x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac <laughs> all over 2a. It's ridiculous. <laughs> now, I don't know how to actually do that, but I remember the equation and I don't know why. Um, so it just stuck with me in my head and you'll never need to know that again, but you will need to know some of those math essentials. And one of the things is absolutely with um, like the IOLTA account, so trust accounts and understanding that. I have known too many attorneys, unfortunately, too many to count that have lost their law, law license over not understanding how business works. You have to have a trust account. You have to follow the rules of the trust account. There's certain financial rules and everybody who is disbarred is not a bad person. Sure, there's people that take advantage, but I know plenty of them who have honestly lost their bar license just because of not having the business skills, not having the team. I mean, you can lose your bar license from losing, to, from, um, from not going to too many court hearings, for example. And not everybody who doesn't make a court hearing is because they're a bad person, but their client has now suffered because they didn't have their calendaring right, or they didn't know how to use their technology, or they didn't, they missed an email that came in that had a notice of when the hearing was going to be. So organization, having the right team, having um, processes and procedures in place, it's so important because you can be the best attorney in the world. You can go to as much school as you want, but if you don't have the basic project management skills, calendaring organization um, and financial skills, then you really need to be on with a firm that does have those um, before considering going off on your own or going and, you know, trying to do this with a team that hasn't really been, that really isn't there for you yet. Right. Yeah. And I think it's just, you know, if you do, you know, work in-house or, you know, at a law firm, I think it's important to even connect with folks from your accounting department or from records or from just the different areas in the firm. So that way you really do truly grasp an understanding of why they are asking you to do what you have to do. Yeah, absolutely. And so number six, the next tip that I want to share with you about what they don't teach in law school is you do not start on day one as being in the trial room, um, having the best cases in the firm. You start off truly at the bottom. Um, and you have to be okay with that. And that's not okay for a lot of attorneys because honestly, as an attorney, a lot of times you are used to doing well. You are, you are obviously a good test taker because otherwise you would not have done well on the LSAT and you wouldn't have done well on um, the bar exam to get you to being licensed. So you were unable to lock some type of code that a lot of people have not been able to, to make it to where you are. And so to come off and you have this prestigious title of attorney, there you will come into a law firm and you are not the top of the food chain anymore. It is very likely that the receptionist knows more about practicing law than you do on day one. There's a lot of very experienced support staff in the law firms and it really comes down to humbling yourself, remembering why you started this profession and knowing that it's going to take some time for you to grow, for you to become the attorney that you want to. And so you have to be ready to go in and do a lot of the things that 
you may not have thought were part of being an attorney. You have to do a lot of the research. The partners have earned the right to pass down to you the work that is not so much their favorite things to do and their favorite things to work on. And there's a lot of self um, learning and research that you're going to have to do that you can't expect a law firm to pay for. So you're, it's going to take you in the beginning researching everything. You have to research everything to learn what are the rules of civil procedure? What am I allowed to do or not do? And that's time that cannot be billed to a client. That's time that is a self-investment because clients are coming to attorneys because they are experts. So the clients are not paying for you to learn how to attorney. The clients are paying for your expertise. And so you are going in there at the beginning, really not knowing anything. You, you've learned a lot in law school, but you have not learned how to practice law yet. And you're going to learn how to practice it and apply it once you get on the job. Exactly. And it's important to understand also that, you know, even though you were done with law school and you have your, you know, your license, you never stop learning in this profession. In fact, it's a requirement that you attend CLEs in order to maintain your license. So you will always be a student in the law. Always. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and paralegals aren't exempt. Nobody is exempt. Rules and rules change. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're governed by rules of civil procedure. Um, you're governed, and even outside of that, you're governed by local rules and federal court rules. Like there's a rule um, base that you have to stay within and those can change at any time. And you are responsible for knowing those rules of how to practice law and what is supposed to happen. So number seven, um, everybody needs their personal board of directors. And the sooner that you understand that the reason you are going to get to keep your law license is by having a great paralegal, the better. They are truly your lifeline and they are necessary because while you're practicing law, all of those procedural issues that are necessary to be on top of whether it be a deadline, whether it be a return call, whether it be um, remembering what a client asked for, that paralegal is really key. You want to be besties with that paralegal. Do not leave that paralegal off of your holiday list. Do not forget that paralegal's birthday. You really want to have a great relationship and value that person. You want to value everyone in the firm, but you really want to make sure that they know you value them. They know that you appreciate them and part and also within having your personal board of directors, you must have a mentor at all times. It exactly. is so important. And I personally am a fan of judges being mentors. They see it all. They've usually started off being attorneys for a number of years before becoming judges. And they just have such a diverse experience and they are used to seeing and having attorneys come in their courtroom all the time. So they know what not to do, what to do, what rubs them the wrong way, what rubs them the right way. Having a mentor is not a weakness, it's a strength. And you need to always have one and you need to always be worried about your circle of people who are going to help you level up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the most successful attorneys that I have seen have such an amazing team behind them, you know, just because you don't see what they do behind the scenes. They really are the ones who are pushing the case forward, um, who really have your back. Um, you know, I've, I've witnessed um, relationships, you know, at firms where the attorneys do not value their staff, and it is the most detrimental thing to their career. Um, you know, sometimes they'll delegate, you know, a lot of personal 
you know, errands or whatever, you know, and really make their assistant feel less than who they are. You know, you need to treat them like people. You need to get rid of this idea that, you know, there's this, you know, hierarchy. These are your colleagues. You know, um, one of the, the greatest moments I had in my career is um, going into a trial and the other side, we were um, doing voir dire um, and introducing ourselves to the jury, to the potential jurors. And um, the other side, you know, went and introduced who was there with him. And he said, this is my associate and this is my assistant. And when they came to our, when it came to our turn to do the introduction, um, the attorney that I was supporting at the time said, this is my colleague. And let me tell you, even that just made such a big difference. Absolutely. You're so right. And I have unfortunately been on both sides of those um, far too many times. Um, number eight, office etiquette. And what I mean by office etiquette is day one at a job, they are not there to teach you the basics of how to use Word, how to use Outlook, how to use Excel, none of those things. As an attorney, you are expected to know at a minimum how to use Microsoft Office. Um, they're not there to show you how to forward emails, add attachments. You're This now, you are truly expected to have your technology game leveled up. You're expected to come in there in, in attorneys. Now it's different than, you know, back in my day, I won't date myself when you had secretaries that you would literally attorney would just print things out and make changes and a secretary would edit it. It's not efficient anymore to have two people working on the same thing. So attorneys are now expected to actually open up their own documents and make their own edits and type in their own, you know, just create their own motions, all of that. And it's very necessary that you learn those tech skills. And if you don't have them, you should get them because that is going to hinder you a lot. And with this changing world and virtual world, we have to know how to be able to jump fast to new ones. You know, some firms are using SharePoint now most firms are using a practice management system where you're saving your documents, entering your time, and being able to just really be self-sufficient at this point. You should be able to almost run a practice on your own without needing kind of an administrative assistant. That's the expectation. You will have that support if you choose to go with a law firm for the most part. However, you need to know how to do those things. That needs to be an added bonus that you have the support, but you should already know how to do them. And then the last one, the last um, little tip that we wanted to leave you with that they don't teach you in law school is you gotta make money. And the only way that you're making money a lot of times is through billing. Of course, there's other options where there's contingency fee cases and so on. However, a lot of times you're going to spend time billing and billing means you now have to account for every minute of your day. You are typing in a narrative. You are saying, I spent this much time doing this activity and billing it to a client. You are having to be aware of um, making sure that you are instilling confidence in a client by not just saying, okay, we are billing you two hours for responding to an email because the client will lose confidence in you and come back and say that should have taken you um, 10 minutes. When, so you also have to be responsible enough to not overbill, to not take more time than what it should take because they're coming to an expert um, is what they see you as, as an attorney. So the billing part of it is very important and it's, there's no getting away from it um, unless you really are going, <laughs> excuse me, thank you. Unless you're going in-house, um, that's one of the perks a lot of times of being in-house. 
um, being in-house counsel is not billing, but if you're at a private law firm, a lot of times you're really going to have to bill clients. Yeah, and I would say even, you know, even if you work for a governmental, you know, um, agency, you know, where you technically don't have to bill, there are some instances where you do need to account for your time, um, especially if you're bringing forward like a motion, you know, for sanctions or a motion to compel where you want to seek your attorney's fees um, because it was kind of an unnecessary motion because the other side wasn't participating. So as Sherilyn mentioned, it's definitely something that you will not get away from no matter what avenue you decide to go. Yeah. And it's really an art. It really truly is an art. Um, there's, you know, billing guidelines. If you have, for example, insurance companies as um, a client, you know, there are just certain things that they will not pay for if it comes off as administrative. Um, so you really have to get creative in your billing in order to get paid. Yeah. And taking those practices learned, one of the things that we do with our company, with some of our clients, um, any of our clients that deal with billing, we make sure that we learn from it. So we are wanting to hear from the clients. We look at what's been written off by the clients and we are training and educating and sharing with our firms. This is what they write off. This is the amount of time they historically approve. So going forward, hey, paralegals, attorneys, you should only be billing this amount of time for um, this activity. Or for example, if there's a client that always takes money off because they say, hey, we don't pay for attorneys to deal with discovery work. Well, then our advice to our client is, hey, they're only paying this for paralegals or we need to word this in this way to get it to get it paid for, there's an art to it. And so that's when the business side of things come in. And that's really what our company does. Mm -hmm. It looks like Denise said that, you know, you, you try so hard not to overbill, um, but you end up working so many extra hours each day. Yeah, like you said, it is, it's definitely a balancing act. Um, it is a balance. and be, Yeah, and you wanna be fair, you know, you wanna be fair um, to your client. And, you know, there may be things that you need to research in order to get whatever it is that you need to get done, done, um, that you can't necessarily bill for. So that's why it's always good to stay in front of all of those things and that you are always learning and keeping yourself, you know, um, up, up to speed, you know, with what's trending, um, you know, with the new rules, all of that. Yep, absolutely. And so the billing thing, um, it's, it's not, it's the least exciting part of every attorney's job, to be honest. And there's no getting around, uh, no getting away from that, as Stephanie mentioned. However, it does get easier it does become more normal. It does become the way of how you look at life. And then it also becomes just a way of how you even, it filters over into your personal life because, you know, if your spouse is having a long enough conversation with you, you're just thinking like, how long has this been going on? <laughs> because <laughs> now everything is all about time and time. And so I am guilty of that as a career builder and um so it's there but it does truly get easier and not only that but it helps you with metrics too i mean you get to look at you know things you know like oh well on average it takes me about you know this long to do a motion um it takes me about this long and obviously it's different for each case right depending on the facts and what claims you have um but at least you have a general idea so that way you know if going forward um you know there might be a gap that you need to fill and sometimes you just have to put which what you think is reasonable because you can't always capture everything 100% unless you're doing it contemporaneous, contemporaneously, which is a challenge by itself because you have people walking into your office, 
you have people calling you while you're in the middle of things. Um, so, you know, it's just in addition to, you know, um, I guess billing, but it, it's, it's important to um, have great time management skills too. build out your day. So that way you are able to isolate yourself and work on things, um, you know, one by one. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's a great tip. And that's certainly what I did is I would, I always started my day with a checklist and everything needed to be off of that checklist before my day ended. And so just to give you guys a little oversight about what we do um, as a whole. Um, so this is our team. This is our leadership team, rather. And we really go into law firms and we not only teach these best practices we were just talking to you about, but we're really able to affect change. And that's why we have enjoyed bringing the business side of things in. So my history, I'm a 20 year paralegal and have seen it all, you know, and I've done every position there is with leadership, with training, with, you know, being a file room clerk, a receptionist, a legal secretary, a paralegal. Um, I've been to trial with attorneys. I've literally done it all. And when it came to that point of where you decide, what am I doing here? Am I going to actually go to law school now and stop playing attorney? Or am, you know, what is my next step? And the thing that kept holding me back is I didn't want to practice law in the way that it was being practiced. And what I mean by that is I'm a very analytical person. And if something doesn't make sense to me, I'm not going to do it. And unfortunately, with working with a lot of law firms, I was always the one that would come to them with a new solution. Even from the, my days as a file room clerk, I would just say, hey, instead of us continuing every month to have to resort every file, why don't we keep it as a running one that just keeps shifting all the way down and we're not having to pull everything down, box it and put it, reorganize it and put it back up. So as long as I can remember, I have cared about processes and efficiencies. And that's the missing piece that I was having in my legal career is I was doing things, in my opinion, that just didn't make sense. The law made sense. The processes did not make sense. Mm -hmm. So instead of going to law school, I went to business school. And that's where I found my love of all things efficiency and project management related. And what we've been able to do is now go into law firms and really affect change in a way that um, adds revenue. It lowers the cost. We do staff augmentation as Stephanie mentioned, she's one of the virtual chief operations officer. So this is a fractional person. It doesn't make sense for a lot of small to mid-sized law firms to necessarily hire a full-time operations officer. But what we have been able to do is find a lot of value in saying, hey, you can have an operations officer and they work maybe 10 hours a week and they're looking at those business principles. And we have a 100% success rate of everything that we do, even though these clients pay us and law firms pay us, they pay us less than we save them. And that's the whole goal here is really to make sure that we can affect change in a positive way for them and get them operating more as a business. And the last thing that I'll leave you with is I reached out to, I was thinking about this presentation last night and I reached out just to a couple of my um, friends in my circle to just say, hey, this is what I'm going to do and I'm talking to these um, potential students and they want it. And I said, what is it that I should say or ask them about what it was that made you go to law school and what you thought would make for a great law school candidate and who you would want to see in your courtroom or alongside next to you in the future. And so one of my really good friends, she's a Dallas County judge and has over 25 years of experience. She's worked in private law, corporate law, um, also has been a judge for the last almost 15 years. 
And I love what her quote said, and that's the very first one. And she said, the best lawyers are the ones who feel they have been called to be one. They are the ones who honor their oaths and our profession when everything around them tells them to use their skill and knowledge to make a buck or pull a fast one. And so that's really, a you know, that's something that you'll hear a lot of attorneys say. So a lot of times, if you talk to people who have been in the game for a while and with the attorneys, they've been attorneys, it's not about success. It's not about money. It truly is. And being an attorney can yield you money, but not all attorneys make a lot of money. A lot of them and especially when you compare it to the number of hours they work. It's one thing to make $100,000, but you, you know, there's a lot of people who make $100,000 and they- they are they working make, 100 hours a week. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, they may sleep four hours a night, right. all of that. And so then the next person with the, um, the next person that said, their, their question would be, what do you want to do with a law degree? And if you don't know what you want to be doing in 10 to 15 years, you should rethink law school. And I thought that was just so interesting because I feel that we come from a world where they say it's okay if you don't know what you want to be when you grow up. And I generally believe that as a mom of six-year-old twins, I don't feel they have to have it figured out. But before investing, as Angie talked about at the you know, head of the call, before investing all of that money, you do need to know a direction. And you do need to know that just because you go to law school doesn't mean that you get to be a lawyer and that you need to go to law school to do the career that you want to do. So there is some searching that has to happen on the front end before you make that commitment. And then I the just, last Go ahead, okay. Stephanie. I just want to say, you know, I, I also had a dream at one point of going to law school. And let me tell you, after over 20 years of being a paralegal, I can say that I'm happy. I'm happy I didn't. Um, it's been a very lucrative career for me. You know, I've still been able to um, do what I wanted to do and make just as big of an impact, if not more, because now at this point in my career, I'm helping baby attorneys, you know, I'm helping even partner level attorneys, you know, keep up with technology. Um, so it's, it's been a very fulfilling career um, to me. And I, you know, personally, I feel like, you know, at least get yourself a little bit of exposure um, to what this looks like um, before you make that big of a commitment. Yeah, no, absolutely. I know um, the attorneys that I feel have backed out of this career more um, than others have usually been because they had no exposure ahead of law school. They had never worked in a law firm. They just knew the glamour that happened on Law and & Order and all of those shows. And so then there becomes this reality check. And that's what we're aiming to talk about in this today. Um, or the things that they don't teach in law school. The last um, quote that I'll leave you with is um, one of the one of my friends that's a founding partner of a very successful law firm here in Dallas. Is she said she would ask, "What are your perceptions of being a lawyer? If it's to be successful, you're missing the real reason of the profession, which is service." And I, as you can see, all of these are kind of the same theme, and these are what people who have skin in the game are saying. So I really wanted to leave that with you all as something to be thinking about, something to know, um, because that is that service is exactly what this is. So that's all I have. Um, I wanted to. I'm three minutes before my. Um, I'm three minutes before. So yeah, you guys I'm can ask, ask any questions. If there's any questions, I'm very happy to answer any. And thank you, Caitlin. I'm glad that this was eye-opening for you. Hopefully and not like in a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> like if you have any questions, you can feel free to either ask in the chat box or jump on camera and ask. It's totally up to you guys, um, but we'll try to get to all of them. So. Mm -hmm.
No, I mean, I think that I wholeheartedly agree with everything that you guys said. You know, I think that there are so many skills that people should teach us in law school that they don't. And it's all the relational stuff that actually is what makes your job, you know, either work or not work. Um, so I think it's so important that you're teaching these lessons to the students today um, because they're all things that I wish that somebody would have taught me when I was in law school. And you kind of, you, you learn on the fly, you learn on the go while you're, you know, working. But if you're trying to learn how to substantively practice law on top of all of that in your first, you know, year or two, it's really, really hard. It's really challenging. So, um, so wonderful job um, and I'm so glad they got to hear from you today. One of the things um, that a lot of students don't understand is really the interaction between paralegals and attorneys. Um, you guys touched on this a lot earlier, you know, but a good paralegal is worth their weight in gold. <laughs> I mean, they really are. And oftentimes when you come in as a young attorney, you know, your paralegal will have so much more experience than you. And if you really start to interact with that paralegal, you'll realize that they have so much to offer you as far as telling you what are the social norms in your firm. Who are the important people in yeah. your firm? Because there's a pecking order. I mean, yes. whether you like it or not, there's a pecking order. And mm -hmm. likely you don't know the pecking order when you first come in. So you have to start, you know, observing other people who you're working with. And if you talk to your support staff and ask them, you know, hey, okay, so this particular partner, you know, asked me to do something, but I've got this other thing that I'm working on for this other partner, you know, who should I go to first and mm -hmm. asking them like can I like move this off my plate yeah. um they'll be able to give you some really invaluable advice as to how to navigate office politics and mm -hmm. and those things that nobody teaches you about so mm -hmm. absolutely you are so right and yeah they will they will give you the tea on everything going on in the office and you know the places to go for lunch and everything so <laughs> and on the other hand if you don't know how to effectively work with your paralegals, that can really shoot you in the foot. If you ask your paralegals to do things that are not properly part of their, you know, job descriptions, some paralegals are much more substantive than others. You know, some, I think that those roles really are not well defined for the most part. In some firms, paralegals really are, you know, secondary to the lawyers. They do a lot of heavy lifting. They do a lot of drafting. They do a lot of substantive work. And then in other firms, it's more of an administrative role. And yeah. So sometimes your paralegal might do both. They might do substantive work and they might do things like, you know, your expense reports and getting your travel done and things like that. But you have to ask, you have to learn how to most effectively use your support staff. And so that they become your, you know, colleagues and your partners instead of just assuming, it, you know, <laughs> assuming makes an ass out of you and me. <laughs> That's always what I heard. You know, it, it can be so true. Like, I mean, if you go in there and you automatically, you know, start bossing people around and ask them, you know, to do things that are not part of their job descriptions, you're going to hear about it real fast. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Angie, you brought up a really good point. I mean, it looks different in, in every firm. So really kind of getting in there and understanding, okay, this is the lay of the land. This is what it looks like here. Um, these are the things that this person can help me with. Um, it's very important that you get a, an early handle on that. Yeah. Yeah. All well, right. this was fun. Thank yeah, you this so much for having cool. us. Thank you so much. And Sherilyn, if you can send me the slides, um, because I think they were a little small on the screen. So when in, on the recording, I'll blow them up so it'll be larger. Perfect. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much to both of you, Sherilyn and Stephanie, for spending time with us today. And thank you for all of the students for sharing your time with us today. We'll be back again um, next week with more meetups. And tomorrow we have our virtual happy hour. So if you wanna actually meet people and get to like know people <laughs> that you've been interacting with on LinkedIn, come to the happy hour and we'll split you out into breakout rooms. You'll actually get to interact with people. It'll be really fun. So um, please feel free to join us tomorrow and we'll see you again next week. Bye everybody.